Hi everyone. Okay, I'm going to go over chapter 7 in your text and I'm actually just going to use the um, the PowerPoint that's already up. I'm not changing it. I'm going to put a couple of extra videos up when I put this video up, but um, so I want you to watch those as well, but I'm not going to um, put them within the PowerPoint or change or change anything from it. Okay, so we're talking about chapter seven. We're gonna talk about physical changes in health, children with disabilities, cognitive changes, and language development. So as far as body growth change, in middle and late childhood, um, there is a slow and consistent growth. So the growth is an average of two, two to three inches per year, gain an average of five to seven pounds per year, their body proportion begins to change um, from that of an infant where the head seems to be wobbly and their the way their body is is just um, not similar proportions to an adult. Um, the ch a child's body is starting to change um, to become closer to what they will be as an adult. Um, muscle mass and strength increase as baby fat decreases. The brain, the total brain volume stabilizes and significant changes in structures and regions occur. So especially, this happens especially in the prefrontal cortex and activation of some brain areas increase um, while others decrease. So as far as motor development, these motor skills become more smoother, more coordinated. Um, they um, improvement of fine motor skills due to increased myelination of the central nervous system. Now, boys outperform girls typically on gross motor skills. Um, you know, those are the large muscle movements, and girls outperform boys in fine motor skills. So, um, you might typically see in kindergarten or so when you're when the students are cutting out shapes, the girls might be a little better at. Um, being able to cut those shapes out more accurately. Now, American children do not get enough exercise. Um, increasing exercise level has positive outcomes, though. So, as far as aerobic exercise benefits, um, there is attention, memory, effortful and goal-directed thinking and behavior, and creativity. Uh, parents and schools play important roles in children's exercise levels, and screen time is linked um, to low activity levels and obesity. And that's why screen time has now become a factor that's included in the lifespan. So as you can um, see that as we progress and as technology changes and as different, um, different generations have different, uh, different pastimes, things of that nature, it changes the lifespan and changes what we study because we, uh, we have to include the current information. As far as health, illness, and disease, middle and late childhood is a time of excellent health. Um, disease and death are much less prevalent, um, but in overweight children, heredity, there's heredity and environmental context. So some children may be overweight, um, mostly due to heredity. They um, may have there are factors in um, biology that impact the weight a child holds, um, but there's also environmental contexts. So these children who are heavier may be more fatigued or something like that and may not get as much exercise. Maybe their parents aren't active. Um, this may happen perhaps if a parent um, is like disabled or something like that where um, there's less opportunities for the child to get out and um, have like experience physical activity. Um, overweight, being overweight in childhood is linked to diabetes, hypertension, and elevated blood cholesterol levels. And as far as cancer, this is the second leading cause of death in children 5 to 14 years old. The most common childhood cancer is leukemia and children with cancer are surviving longer and um, there are advancements in treatment. I will try to find a good video um, about leukemia and um, 
childhood experiences with leukemia. That will be one of the videos I hope to upload. Um, these are the types of cancer that are prevalent in children. Um, you can see leukemia is um, vastly more prevalent than other types, um, but brain cancer, if you, if you put leukemia and brain cancer, make up as much as all the rest of it combined. Um, but brain cancer still is only 15%, whereas leukemia is a huge percentage. As far as learning disabilities, um, this is a learning disability is difficulty in learning um, that involves understanding or using spoken and written language, listening, thinking, reading, writing, and spelling. But approximately 80% of children with learning disability have problems with reading. Um, the types of learning disabilities mentioned in your text, dyslexia, severe impairment, and the ability to read and spell. So um, there is a number now, I don't know if you, uh, you students are aware of this, but there is a number, um, a Lexile range that um, refers to reading like um, grade level type information for parents. Sometimes uh, I get information about my, my kids when they take tests, um, like standardized tests about their Lexile range because that this refers to their reading ability. Um, so dyslexia, that's a good way to remember that that's about reading and spelling. Um, dysgraphia is difficulty in handwriting. This one you probably don't hear nearly as much about um, as you would dyslexia, which is a common, uh, more common that you've probably heard of. And dyscalculia, I remember telling you about this um, previously. I have a friend who... Uh, has issues with um, math uh, and these are not I know um, you might say that oh everyone has issues in math but this is much more um, much more problematic um, this might be something where a student um, cannot understand some very basic concepts and thus can't move on because as we know um, math uh, learning in in math especially progresses from um, you learn you learn numbers and you learn addition and subtraction and um, division and multiplication and then as you get further along you still have to use what you previously learned so building upon those concepts is very difficult um, so um, someone with discal dyscalculia may um, struggle getting even basic concepts after they've had tutoring um, for, for example um, sitting down with with them with um, math problems and helping them through it and then the very next day they still they have no idea how to do it it just they cannot um, it doesn't it may not click with them. Now for learning disabilities, the percentage of all children in public schools, um, there's 4.7% have, um, it says children with a disability who actually receive special education services, 4.7% receive um, special education services, and then 2.8% receive, um, it, and this is only in public schools, 2.8% receive special education services for speech or hearing impairments. Um, there's for intellectual di disabilities, it's only 0.9%. For autism, it's 0.9%. And for emotional disturbances, it's 0.8%. As far as ADHD, this is another common, um, common term that you've probably heard of. It's characterized by inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. Um, the number of children diagnosed has increased. Um, this possible causes are genetics, brain damage during prenatal or postnatal development, cigarette and alcohol exposure during prenatal development, low birth weight, high physical activity level, and adolescence was linked to lower level of ADHD in emerging adulthood. So that's a good sign. Um, if you if you haven't 
it may, I'm not sure if any of you ever were diagnosed with ADHD at one point, but if you haven't um, had the chance to observe someone with ADHD, uh, there are varying degrees of, of problems that uh, some, some, can, some children can control it a little better than others. Um, there are some that is that are way over the top. Um, particularly, I did tutoring for children with ADHD, um, several of them, and um, I remember one he he couldn't he couldn't keep track of what I was trying to say, but he did his best. I could tell he was struggling, and we worked through it and. We were able to get through it, it just took longer. Um, another child physically could not sit still and began climbing the wall and laying on the floor and doing everything possible during our tutoring session to um, basically satisfy that need. Um, they wanted to be um, up and hyperactive and it was very difficult for them to get through, uh, but I worked with them a little bit to try to find some tactics that would keep them still, and that seemed to help a bit. So regions of the brain in which children with ADHD had a late, delayed peak in the thickness of the cerebral cortex. Um, one thing I want to note, I want you to notice specifically, is the prefrontal cortex here. Um, if you remember, this is the executive function area, the planning and reasoning and um, logical thought, you know. Um, so having this delayed it could be really problematic for kids. And this is, um, let's see, greater than two years delay here. Um, so imagine this this child and they're just not basically not um, behaving in the same way as the other children in class because they're great you know this is a, a long they're acting like children that may be a few years behind um, behind what you would normally expect so that I'm sure is very difficult and frustrating for teachers educators Autism spectrum disorders. So there's a, a range, a range from autism disorder to Asperger's syndrome. So autistic disorder is more severe. Um, Asperger's syndrome is milder. Autism disorders can often be detected as young as one to three years. So for autistic disorder, the more severe, um, there's deficiencies in social relationships, abnormalities in communication, and restrictive repetitive stereotypes pat stereotyped patterns of behavior um, these children might have very um, restricted ways that they do things they might want to use the same plate um, they might and they might get very upset if they don't um, they might have outbursts and to many people around them um, these kids might seem, it may seem unruly sometimes if they have these outbursts. However, there's not a lot that a parent in that situation may be able to do. Um, they have to learn different techniques. So having your child behave in this way at first is um, quite frankly frustrating for these parents. Asperger's syndrome, they have good verbal language skills, but they have a restrictive range of interests and relationships. So they may only have um, one friend that they they want to spend their time with. Um, as far as restrictive range of interests, um, this might be seen in, this is um, likely seen in um, both autistic disorder and Asperger's syndrome. This will be, um, they have one topic maybe that they want to discuss all the time like they love airplanes and that their love of airplanes they want 
their shirts to have airplanes on them. They might want to watch airplane shows. They, I mean, this it's over above and beyond something that like typical children have interest in, or you see how children might have be interested in one thing for a while and then move on. This is more a really focused interest. So individuals with um, Disabilities Education Improvement Act. So this mandates for providing educational services to children with disabilities, including individualized education plans, IEPs, or what they're referred to typically, they're, which is a written statement that is specifically tailored for the disabled student. Um, the least, res least Restrictive Environment, LRE, is a setting that is as similar as possible to the one in which the non-disabled children are educated and inclusion. So educating a child with special education needs full-time in the regular, regular classroom. So Piaget's concrete operational stages from 7 to 11. Um, this is saying a child can perform concrete operations and reason logically as applied to specific concrete examples. Classification, seriation, so the ability to order stimuli along a quantitative dimension. And transitivity, ability to logically combine relations to understand conclusions. So when considering Piaget's theory, so concrete operational abilities do not appear in synchrony. Um, Education and culture exert strong influences on children's development. Um, Neo, oh, I never can say this correctly, so I apologize, I'm going to butcher it. Neo Piagetians argue that Piaget got some things right, but that his theory needs considerable revision. Um, they elaborated on Piaget's theory and they gave more emphasis to how children use attention, memory, and strategies to process information. Long-term memory is a relatively permanent and unlimited type of memory. So it increases with age during middle and late childhood, um, considering knowledge and expertise. So experts have acquired extensive knowledge about a particular content area. So this would be... The, again, like a child, if a child, I know my son um, was really interested in presidents, and I mentioned that in one of the classes, and he loved to just read about presidents for a long time, and um, he could probably, even though he hasn't really picked up a book about presidents for several years, he could probably still um, tell me some facts about presidents, because he he looked at these books and read these um, different things online and he um, I, I don't even know how many books he read but we got him a little children's dictionary and a little specific book about presidents and he could probably tell me more than I or more than I know just because these um, these facts have been encoded in his long-term memory so strategies are deliberate mental activities that improve the processing of information. Elaboration, that's a really important one. Um, extensive processing of the information. Engage in mental imagery, understanding the material, repeat with variation, embed memory relevant language. So elaboration, um, this is why I ask you to reflect on your notes. Um, by taking something and adding to it and considering how it relates to you and considering um, other examples, you're going above and beyond just what you've learned in the text or just what the text tells you. And this helps you remember it um, a lot more than just basically jotting down exactly what the text says. Fuzzy trace theory, there's two types of memory representations, verbatim memory trace, precise details of information, or the gist, the central idea of information. So during early elementary years, children begin to use gist more. Um, so when you think of a concept, 
it's a little easier to get like what is the gist of this um so that's kind of like comprehension so um reading the book and thinking major themes things like that but it's very difficult to recall exact quotes so if, if that's a good example for you guys that might help um, thinking involves manipulating and transforming information into memory thinking critically and creatively okay so I think we all understand thinking relatively well taking information um, basically connecting it um, to other information that we already have and um, even learning new information and trying to uh, put the puzzle pieces together right Critical thinking involves thinking reflectively and productively evaluating evidence. Creative thinking is the ability to think in novel and unusual ways and come up with unique solutions to problems. So convergent um, thinking produces one correct answer and that's tested by standardized intelligence tests. Um, divergent thinking produces many answers to the same question, which is a creativity type test. So for convergent thinking, that would be, um, that could also be something like um, the SAT or um, like the the ones that have the, the questions where one is the correct answer and you have to get it right. But as far as divergent thinking, there is a, a creativity test that I have administered before to children and it's called the torrent test of creativity and basically the um, if I can find a video on it I might put that for you guys to look at but I'm not sure it uh, it's, might be unlikely that there is a video but basically the child is given a um, a booklet with they have like maybe a line or five lines on the page and they're told that they have so many minutes to make whatever they want with those with those pictures so for example um, the the first page or the the first page might have an oval and as a student who um, is thinking more like typical and less creative is might make that into look like a potato or something like that or an eye however a student who has more creative thoughts might change that into an entire um, you know little setting or something like that but you basically use that shape in a way that is different than di excuse me different than what other students use that shape typically so um, and this test um, there's several pages that students have to use and then this test is scored based on these um, specific criteria about the the level of creativity of this child metacognition is <clears throat> how we think about how we think basically cognition about cognition it consists of several dimensions of executive function including planning self-regulation regulation and memory strategies <clears throat> meta memory is knowledge about memory executive function it, um, the most important areas for the children's cognitive development and school success self-control inhibition um, inhibition is basically being able to control these uh, urges to um, do these behaviors that they should not be doing um, working memory and flexibility intelligence is the ability to solve problems and to adapt and learn from experiences so there are individual differences there are stable consistent um, ways in which people differ from one another um, the Binet test so there's mental age so that's how um, the individual's level of mental development relative to others. Um, intelligence quotient, the IQ, is a mental age divided by the chronological age multiplied by 100. Um, <clears throat> so if we had everyone take this IQ test, it would follow the normal distribution if, we, if 
we had enough participants that it should follow a normal distribution. Um, most scores falling in the middle of the possible most scores of falling in the middle of the possible range. That will, that's what normal distribution is. It's a bell curve, which you've probably heard in Psych 101. <clears throat> A few scores appear toward the extremes of the range. So um, you'll learn later on in statistics when you take it, if you haven't already, that um, the extremes, these are um, the ends of the bell curve. And typically, um, when you're considering whether something's statistically significant, it's going to be somewhere in the these little tails, right? Okay, here's the bell curve. So here would be the tails. And this is where this is where most people are. This is where most people um here's Stanford Binet's IQ test. And most like the average is one hundred and then the standard deviation is fifteen. So that means fifteen at each one of these uh standardized uh lines. Um so here is probably most like students in college at probably this level and higher are going to be more in this range, um, less so here. So we're in college, we've made it past, like you guys are in college, you've made it past um, freshman year, you're moving up, um, you even made it to college, so you likely have a higher IQ than um, the average IQ. Hope that makes sense. So, I'm having trouble reading this, so, um, but there's another Wech, um, Wechsler Intelligence Scale for Children. This is the fourth edition. I actually think that's been the. I don't. I I don't even remember when there was a third edition. To be honest, um, they have verbal and nonverbal um, subscales. So similarities, a child must think logically and abstractly to answer a number of questions about how things might be similar. So in what ways are a lion and a tiger alike? Um, comprehension, this subscale is designed to measure an individual's judgment and common sense. So like what is the advantage of keeping money in a bank? So a, a child should be able to give um, at a certain point and these can be um, adapted right based on what other children that that age would say but what are the the advantages of keeping money in a bank now as far as block design so a child must assemble a set of multicolored blocks to match designs that the examiner shows okay so um, I hope that makes sense here are the blocks and the examiner would have a design show and show this this child and the child must take the blocks and create this design based on these blocks so an example says use use the four blocks on the left to make the pattern on the right that's what the examiner would say to the child and they're, they're likely there's a um, they time it and that um, that helps decide, you know, how quickly was this child able to um, come up with this design correctly. There's in Sternberg's tri triarchic theory of intel intelligence. I apologize, I cannot speak today. I'm having so much trouble with that. Um, there's analytical intelligence, the ability to analyze, judge, evaluate, <coughs> compare, and contrast. Creative intelligence, which is the ability to create, design, invent, originate, and imagine. And practical intelligence, which is the ability to use, apply, implement, put ideas into practice. So, honestly, I particularly prescribe to this type of theory. I think it makes sense. Um, we, I, I observe this in daily life. There are several several times where I see people that seem to be better at analytical skills. Um, other people seem to be really good at creative skills. And then um, there's a lot of 
people that seem to have good practical intelligence, which to me is more like um, street smarts or um, hands-on things. Um, I'm not sure. What do you guys think? So I hope to hear what you guys think maybe next time I see you. Um, children with different triarchic patterns look different in school. Okay, also consider that perhaps a student might be decent at all three, or there's just different um, ways that this could be, um, this could show in different children. So perhaps decent analytical skills, also really, really creative, um, but maybe not as practical or something of that nature. So Gardner's eight frames of mind are um, verbal, mathematical, spatial, bodily or kinesthetic, musical, interpersonal, intrapersonal, and naturalist. And although I used to really um, like this theory because I feel like it captured a little bit more, I also think it's it, pulling it apart that much might be less um, beneficial to the theory itself. So I'm not sure. What do you guys think about that? Although I'd love to think um, mu music has its own intelligence. However, um, in Sternberg's theory, there's a creative intelligence, which is really good. Um, and I know that there's also a correlation between math intelligence and music, um, the ability to play music, things of that nature, or musical intelligence, I guess you could, you could call it, or something of that nature. So that, to me, is really interesting because I feel like it, it perhaps hits on those same areas of the brain and almost I'm not sure if I would have to look more into the research because I haven't done a, a ton of research on it even though I actually did buy a book about it I haven't read it but um, I think it would be interesting to consider now culture and intelligence what is viewed as intelligent varies by culture um, consider uh, like an indigenous culture versus our culture. Having someone from an indigenous culture take the IQ test does not make any sense whatsoever. Even if they spoke English or the test was translated into a language that they understood, it doesn't make sense because of the types of questions asked on an intelligence test or the IQ test that we have um, versus the type of knowledge used in cultures like that. Um, interpreting differences in IQ scores, so influences of genetics, environmental influences, group differences, and culture fair tests. Um, culture fair tests are designed, are designed to be free of cultural bias, but I, someone had mentioned in the text, I can't remember the name, that there's likely no culture fair test because someone has to make this test and there, it's just going to be extremely difficult to take away all of the bias. Okay. Um, the correlation between intelligence test scores and twin status. So identical twins, a similarity of their intelligence, um, intelligence scores is uh, about 0.75 and fraternal twins, it's about point, um, point 0.6. So you can see that genetics, it kind of shows that genetics is important there, but not necessarily. I, I don't see, um, I didn't see the research on this. I didn't read any articles outside of the text, but you have to also consider, um, were these, these fraternal twins or these identical twins? Now they must have 
I, th I believe they would be um, in different environments, but I'm not sure just in case that that um, environment would be impactful. Um, but I think with the typically knowing what I've learned from graduate school, what the typically accepted idea is, is that there is based on your genetic makeup, and this makes sense because consider um, disabilities and things of that nature as well. Based on your genetic makeup, there is a range for for this intelligence that could perhaps happen. I'm not sure how large the range is, but just say you have a range based on genetics. But the environment and how um, nurturing it is and how how much you are exposed to as you um, develop in the lifespan is what determines where you end up in that range. So I hope that I hope I articulated that well enough for you guys to understand what I'm trying to get at. But basically, I'm saying it's both nature and nurture. So nature might determine the potential, but nurture determines um, where, where you actually end up. Um, intellectual disability, so there's limited mental ability reflective of low IQ and difficulty adapting to everyday life. There's a range of mild to severe levels of intellectual disability. Um, organic retardation is caused by a genetic disorder or brain damage. Um, cultural familial retardation, there's no evidence of organic brain damage. The IQ here is between 50 and 70, whereas the organic it was, was lower. Gifted students are above average intelligence or and or superior talent for something. There's three criteria, um, precocity, march to their own drum, passion to master. And um, I think I mentioned this just in the early class because I wanted you guys to understand mastery goals were super important versus um, performance goals. Um, there's nature and nurture link of giftedness. I apologize, that's my phone. Um, domain specific giftedness and education of children who are gifted. Now the I can tell you a little bit extra about the education of children who are gifted. Um, there right now isn't like a, a really good agreed upon definition of giftedness. So that makes it really difficult to as an educational psychologist that makes it really difficult in our position to decide where to go with with programs and um, how to provide funding and how to write policy um, how, so how how can policy be written whenever there are so many different definitions of giftedness and if you were to look at different schools um, and their gifted programs they are all different. Um, just because we're in Indiana does not mean um, the programs are for giftedness from one school to the other are going to be the same. So I think that is a little surprising to some people. But um, I did contact all 50 states at some point in my graduate career because I did have to gather information about the definitions of giftedness and what um, how these states kind of portrayed giftedness so and they were not all consistent which makes it really difficult for like a common type of program uh, vocabulary grammar and meta linguist <coughs> sorry I still have a cough and it's not going away <coughs> um, meta linguistic awareness so changes occur in the way children's mental vocabulary is organized Categorization becomes easier as children increase vocabulary 
and similar advances made in grammar skills. Um, metalinguistic awareness is knowledge about language. It improves considerably during middle and late childhood. Um, understandings of how to use language in culturally appropriate ways. Um, you should be able to, uh, one thing I might suggest for a uh, potential assignment later on would be to talk to children at different ages and uh, about just ask about them and their friends and their life and um, compare that to maybe children um, younger like interview a three to four year old versus a seven or eleven year old something like that and you'll see great differences in the way these children talk um, reading so there's whole language approach which is reading instruction should parallel children's natural language learning um, and then the phonics approach <coughs> Reading instruction should teach basic rules for translating written symbols into sounds. So, um, I'm not sure how you guys grew up learning, um, but sound, sound it out, sound it out. That's a phonics approach. Um, children benefit from both approaches, but instruction in phonics needs to be emphasized. It is a better method is to, um, is to focus on phonics, sounding um, little sections out. Things like that. Um, fluency is key uh, is a key element in learning how to read. <clears throat> and then, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. Second language learning. So bilingualism has a positive effect on children's cognitive development. So subtractive bilingualism is going from monolingual in the home language to bilingual among monolingual speakers. Um, this is common among immigrant children. Negative effects in becoming ashamed of their home language. So, um, you these immigrant children that maybe um, they only have, let, for example, let's consider a Hispanic child in our society whose parents only speak Spanish, but they, um, these children go to school early and are able to learn English relatively quickly, but their parents may not know very much English throughout their, their time. They may, um, may not learn English as well. Um, and this child might learn English really quickly in school and become very fluent. So imagine this child is their bilingual. This child might end up being their interpreter sometimes. Um, and I did see this when I, while I was at IU East in, in undergrad, I was in Spanish and I did have to, um, <clears throat> volunteer at this <clears throat> center, Townsend Center, I think it's still in town, where I would help, um, families learn, fa the Hispanic families learn English and I would see the, their children would come in with them and they the children were able to speak really good english whereas the parents were not this wasn't very uncommon um the dual language education is teaching english language learners english only and dual language instruction in home english or home language and english <coughs> okay guys so i apologize for not changing this up this week um, I have not felt well at all, um, but what I would like for you guys to do for the next class is just to read chapter 8. Make sure you have all your late work turned in. I I really need that turned in so I could get the grades in. Um, I'll probably, if whatever's not turned in soon, I'll probably have to give zeros to. Um, but read chapter 8. Get your notes done, and you'll just turn in your chapter 7 and 8 notes for this week. And we are going to talk about chapter eight, 8 in your next class. So I hope this was helpful. I apologize if I coughed or had trouble speaking <coughs> <coughs> too much. I hope that wasn't too loud in your ear. So I will talk to you guys on Wednesday. Um, have a good evening.